good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Marka Daly. <laughs> yes, of the Swift Daly house. My grandparents restored that house to its 1741 glory. And I'm the archivist and museum curator at the East Ham, for the East Ham Historical Society. And I've been giving a few talks every few months here as a partnership between the Council on Aging and the Historical Society. And it's been really, really fun for me. I have to tell you, this is one of the most complicated presentations that I've ever tried to put together. <laughs> And I think I might have done it. <laughs> you will let me know afterwards, I'm sure. This is a map that the Cape Cotter put out, March 25th, 1965. And it's called Old Timers Preserve East Ham's Names. So I thought it was really appropriate to begin with this title slide, and what it is is all of the inland waterways of East Ham with all of the names of what they are on the far side um, over here. And these lines are just pointing to where those actual thing, places are. I'm not going to go into any detail about this map. It's simply my introduction. We have <coughs> copies of them at the archives, and it's a really neat map that we just love. So I will give you a brief, a brief outline of today's presentation. In the beginning, I am going to give you some maps, aerial maps, of East Tim by the Cape Cod Commission, and they caught, it's from their chronology map viewer. All of you can go online and find that. It is absolutely fascinating, and I've just adapted it for my own purposes with this presentation. I'm going to give you some historical, historic context, also some personal context of how I became interested and fascinated by all the name changes. And finally, I'm going to look in some detail at the ponds and beaches, the rivers and creeks, and the roads, and special places of East Ham, bygone times, and even some things that are not here, but that might have been here. We're going to start with 1938. We're going to go 14 years to 1952. We'll go to 1971, 1994, and 2020 for each of these maps. And I'll, I'm not going to comment except to point out for to the railroad, really, the tracks, so that you know where you are. So this is Southeast Tam. Here are the railroad tracks. And here is Route 6 coming right up here. There are some changes you may notice. I think I might ask you when a particular year slide comes up, if you were here in 52, raise your hand. If you were here in 38, raise, you know, 71, 94. It would be very interesting for me to see that. Here we go. 1938, Southeast Tam, not a lot of buildings. 1952, Southeast Tam. Oh, several people from 1952. I was also here then. 1971, we have some development going on. 1994. <laughs> Quite a bit of development. 2020 in Southeast Tam. <laughs> this is Central East Tam, the center. 
Again, we have the railroad. We have all the ponds from the center. This is Salt Pond, and this is Route 6 again. 1952, we have some developments going in on the West Shore, the Bay Shore. 1971, 94, 2020. <laughs> Here is Northeast Tam. I'll point out the railroad, of course, and I'll point out the Northeast Tam Depot right here in 38. Um, this is Route 6, and this is Brackett's Corner. Lots of farmland in 1938. In 52, there was still quite a bit of farmland in Northeast Tam. In 71, the high school was just being built. It opened in 71. The last graduating class was from Nauset in 71. 1974, 94, the high school is here, whoops, and 2020. <laughs> But notice what happened over here. It's the park. <laughs> and then the East Ham Wellfleet Line. 1938, we've got the railroad, of course, and we've got Route 6. Somewhere right around here, you'll see the drive-in. And somewhere up in here, this is Marconi Beach. So in 1952, 1971 is the drive-in, and Marconi parking lot. 1994, quite a few little developments in here and down here. This is where Audubon is, and 2020. That was just to whet your appetite. I'm going to be going back to the past. I'm going to look at roads, waterways, as they were. I cannot deal with all of the newer roads that we saw there. So when I was young, my mother was one of the town registrars. And I would go with her when she visited homes of people to do the census. And the old folks, I only remember the old folks, <laughs> would tell stories about when they were answering the questions for the census. And I was always fascinated. When we were older, we rode our bicycles everywhere. We only had to be back for supper. <laughs> And we knew all of East Ham, especially our side of the highway, and our house is right next to the East Ham Superette um, on the post office side. On, and so the windmill was our playground, you know, <laughs> the library. Uh, we knew all the roads, but not anymore. So in the archives, we get lots of inquiries, many inquiries, about old homes, ancestors' homes, where a particular business used to be. And I've spent a lot of times with old maps trying to find the answers to these questions. I'm a volunteer for the election work. And every time you go to vote, you are asked for your address. And as we get the addresses, we turn to each other and say, do you know that road? Do you know where that is? I would say maybe three quarters, seven eighths of the roads nowadays I never heard of. 
And so I think that I wanted to do a talk like this to go back to the older roads, the ones that I was familiar with and did know. I didn't realize how confusing that was going to be. Where did I look? I looked in the land grant records that we have at the archives. I looked in the early town meeting records that we have. I looked at maps. We have many 19th century, all the maps of the 1800s are wonderful. They show the roads, but they do not name the roads, as you'll see. They have little blocks for the homes and the family names of who live in those homes. You, they list salt works, they list depots, they put down creeks and ponds, they do list those. We had a 1901 street directory, which is wonderful, but in that street directory for 1901, there were only 18 streets or avenues or roads listed. The old East Ham histories, Freeman, Pratt, and Deo, I always go back to them. They were published in 1844, 1890, and mm, early 1900s. What I discovered, what I noticed as I went through these resources were that there were several categories of names. So there were family names, Aunt Jemima, Widow Harding, Deborah, Jeremiah. There were Native American names, Samoset, Massasoit, Aspinet, and of course, Nosset. There were English names, East Ham, Billingsgate, Truro, that would have been familiar to the early settlers here. And there were town leaders, Governor Prince, Deacon John Doan, Selectman Wiley or Mulford. And there were physical characteristics that things were named for. Fort Hill, Meeting House, Depot, Herringbrook, Campground, the West Shore, the Bridge. There were places that were known only through their stories, that are known only through their stories now. <coughs> Millennium Grove, Cedar Swamp, Briggs Field, French Cable Station, Cedar Bank Links. We've heard of them, but they're not around anymore but there are road signs perhaps for them. So I, I get, tend to get caught up in details and I get, it's an old history, it's, it's a work by William D. Hersh, Hershey that, who wrote in 1962 using all of the documents from the early 1700s. And I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> and then I went, hold it, keep it simple, keep it simple. So I decided I needed a road map. And here it is. I needed to make sense of all the information and lists that I was um, gathering. And this is how I used to teach my students to plan their essay writing. When a student was writing an essay, and they would just start writing. And I'm like, do you know where you're going? <laughs> no. But you know, I'd say, well, you'll be surprised where the writing takes you. But if you want an organized essay, then you get all of your ideas together on paper and you categorize them or pull them together in little clumps because they're related. And then step back and take a look and say, where do you want to start? I wanted to start with the aerial layers and I numbered it number one. And then I thought I would go to the roads in green. And I had 2A for roads over there and the committee and 2B and 2C. And then I decided on ponds and creeks and ridges, but I didn't know in which order. So I just have 3A, 3B, 3C. 
It didn't really work out, but to extend the mat metaphor, it's very easy to redirect yourself or take a detour if you have everything in front of you, and then it's easier to know where you're going. So, town planning committees in the 1920s. We went back to the annual town reports and we read the Warrens and we read the, I say we, because my brother who helps me in the archives and Mary helps in the archives. And as we're researching, especially my brother, we, he says, hey, look at this one that I found in the town reports. And one of them was committees. In 1926, there was a request at town meeting to name East Tams roads because most of them were not named. There, were, there was also a request to have three dumps in East Ham, Southeast Ham, Central East Ham, and Northeast Ham. And there was also a request to have town landings in East Ham. And they formed three different committees. So they had a committee for the town dumps to look into the places and possibilities. They had a committee for the town landings to talk to the owners of the lands that they might need to take the land from, and they had a committee for the town roads. This is from the town report. To appoint a committee of five to list the streets and roads and provide a name for each, and they'll obtain figures on the approximate cost of signs for the streets. I need you to take a look at the names of the people on this committee. Sarah Smith, Eva Collins, Blanche Keefe, who was the librarian, Ruth Whiting, Lucille Brewer. It was the only committee of women. It was the only committee that actually got their names approved and passed. <laughs> the others never came to fruition. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh. So I'm going to give you some examples of early place names and changes. Just an aside, apostrophes were not used in street names except for Martha's Vineyard. And that's because of the National Geographic survey maps. That's what they had said. That was the protocol. So I don't use apostrophes in any of the street names, and they're not on the roads either. Start with Nauset. This place was known as Nauset. The Nossets had lived here for thousands of years, a tribe of the Wampanoags. In 1644, six families moved here from Plymouth, and they called it Nauset Plantation. They had permission to be here. Two years later, they incorporated Nauset as a town, and there were seven families by then. And five years later, the, on June the 7th, 1651, it is ordered that the town of Nauset be henceforth called and known by the name of East Ham, because every village and township here had to have an English name. And the only one that does, I don't know if Provincetown is English, but all the rest are. <laughs> Not sure. Another example, the King's Highway. The King's Highway followed an old Indian path 
from the upper cape on down. Now highway, when you think, when I think highway, I think big road. It didn't mean that in the past. A highway was only a way to get to a particular place and it was the most common way, so it was the highway that was used. So it did not mean a big road. It could be very small. The highway became, in 1720, a county road because it was ordered to be built from Harwich to Truro. And on the 1795 map that we have in the archives and at the museum, that's called Country Road. And I thought, typo? No, of course they didn't have typing. And I realized from William Hershey's report on the 1700s that different towns and different could do variations on a name, as you will. So they, they were not consistent from town to town, whether it was county or country. When I was growing up, it was County Road. And soon after, it was GAR Highway. We knew it was Route 6 because in 1920, there was a statewide numbering system that went into being. And it joined up with other Route 6 in other states. And it's in the 20s that Route 6 first stretched from Provincetown to California. And I'm sure you've seen that sign heading out of Provincetown that says so many, 3,450 miles or something to California on Route 6. So Route 6 was always there, but it was called by and had signs for other names as well. The Grand Army of the Republic was organized in 1866 to honor the fallen soldiers of the Civil War, once known as the War of the Rebellion. And so this was GAR Highway, Grand Army of the, there's still one, a couple of those signs in town down in Northeast Ham, I know there's one at least. When it was widened from a two lane highway to a four lane highway in 1938, it was called the State Highway. And on the maps, it's called Main Street in East Ham and Main Road in Northeast Ham. <laughs> this is a quiz. Tell me when this photo was taken. That is the aforesaid highway, road. <laughs> you can see the schoolhouse. You can see the state police barracks right here. You can see Mrs. Brewer's house right here, which is hidden by trees now. And you can see the old town hall. Decade? 30s? Oh, 20s. Before that. Well, they put down, it was not much before that. Do you think? Um, I'd say in the 1800s, I'm not sure. They didn't have the cinder roads in the 1800s. They didn't come until the 1900s. They do have electricity. Um, electricity came oh, in the okay. mid-20s. Okay. Okay. Provincetown got electricity before East Ham did. It started at that end of the Cape and came up. It's from another presentation. Another early example, Enoch, Enos Rock, Doan Rock, and Great Rock. All the same rock. <laughs> Deacon John Doan was one of the founding families in East Tim. He had his homestead and estate on 
what is now known as Doan Road, which some of you probably passed to, to come in here. It was also known as um, I have to get it right. It was also known as Great Rock Ro Street and Great Rock Road. It's the one that goes to Coast Guard. And Enoch, called Enos, was his son. So that's why it was called. You'll see the passage of time in East Ham with these photos. This is the earliest photo that we have. <laughs> this is a few years later. I, I think this is the late 1800s. This one is the early 1900s. And the couple with their dog at the top of the rock are Captain and Mrs. Peniman. <laughs> and this is 1950s. And the trees have grown. And these are all from the archives, the photos. Here's one of the 1880 maps. So I took a central part of the map. I underlined the ponds in blue, and they're the only, practically the only things that are named. The other thing that has a name is OCRR, Old Colony Railroad, and Nosset Beach, Beacons is named. Everything else is, sorry, named by what it is. So there are two depots in this map. There are schools, the meeting house, shops, windmill, a fish house down where First Encounter is, and ice houses, the post offices, and town halls. <clears throat> and of course, the people and where they lived. I'm going to show you some, with my little arrow here, some of the roads that the ladies from 1928 named. So their description of Nosset Road, where we are, says um, from Main Road East Ham to Main Street Northeast Ham. That's it. So here we are. This, is, this was the main road. There was a little chink chunk in it um, that's no longer there. And this is Nosset Road that comes up, 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 and goes right past the depot, which is behind the stop share sign. <laughs> you can just see the end of it. That was Nosset. Samoset. Samoset was from a main tribe of Indians. Uh, he was abducted many years before the pilgrims came and sent to Spain. And he made his way to England, learned the language, came back. His village in Maine had been wiped out. He came down to visit Massasoit in this area, who Massasoit isn't actually a name, but we use it as a name. It really means Grand Sachem of the Wampanoag, so it was his title, but everyone became, came to know him by that. So now we think it's a name, but it wasn't really. That was something new that I learned. <laughs> and went to see the settlers in Plymouth and greeted them in English and according to one history, asked them for some beer. <laughs> um, Aspinet was the sachem of the Nossets, which is part of the confederation of the Wampanoags. Aspinet is not on this map. It's just, whoops, <laughs> I can't go up any further. It's just off the map. When you come out of Nosset Road and then head towards Wellfleet, the first little jog to the left, 
And School Road, the ladies named this, oh, here it is. Here it is, right here. Now this is Salt Pond Hill that goes up here, but this is School Road because it had the school on it. Mm -hmm. And it comes right out onto Nauset. Mm -hmm. We call it Schoolhouse now. I'm going to move to a wonderful, all right, the quiz time. Scott White had an aerial photo of East Tim. This is it. And it has all the pawns. So I want you to name the pawns for me. And I'll tell you, some of them have three names through the years. A couple of them were one pond, but are now two ponds. <laughs> one man-made and the other naturally made. Where shall we start? With the largest? Great pond. 100% so far. Where else shall we go? How about here? We'll, we'll go counterclockwise. Bridge, bridge, pond? bridge Pond. There's a little bridge. Bridge Pond, I talk about later because it's the conduit for the herring run from first encounter to Great Pond. Next to Bridge, one of the family members is it's named for a for a widow Harding. widow harding i have never been able to find her i did some research for someone years ago looked searched and searched could not find which harding family but there were many three names I never knew this as Herring Pond, which everyone knows it is as now. Lawton Pond. Judge, Judge Lawton lived there. And before him, the Cole family. It was Cole's Pond. I have a photo later on. This is just to whet your appetite. Lawton Road is named for the judge, too. What about this one? Aunt Jemima. Jemima, or Aunt Jemima, or Ice House, or Little Muddy. <laughs> because there is a muddy pond here. It's right here. That's Muddy Pond. This one, Depot, other alternate name? Mill. Mill, alternate name? <laughs> it's behind the library. It's really long. <laughs> and this used to be part of it. But it's now called Depot? Little Depot. Because that was Big Depot. Because the depot was right here. Salt. Salt. And you can tell by the color. It's the only one that's lighter. And way up here, there are four or five ponds. They're tiny. And they're called the halfway ponds because they're halfway between the two boundaries of East Ham, Orleans and Wellfleet. They're right there. Oh, forgot this one. This used to be one pond. Well, this is Ministers. Meeting House was the larger one because it led up to the Meeting House. This is. Um, 
yeah, this is the cemetery. So the road went right up to the, where the old meeting house was. This one is now known as Schoolhouse Pond, yeah. too. Yeah. So there they all are, and you did it without any help. <laughs> Salt Pond, we're going to zoom in on some of the ponds and I'll give you a little bit of history of them. So let me see what I want to say about Salt Pond. I'm going to show you photos through the years. I have three so slides for Salt Pond. We'll start with the Sparrows collection of glass negatives. 1906. That's looking from Salt Pond out towards the inlet and the ocean. And I believe that has to be a ship out there. Salt Pond River, yeah. Yes. And this building is still there. This would be the little tiny, you know, where the town hall is and everything. We have a photo very similar to this in the Swift Daily House in the front room. We have Salt Pond in the winter. I love this photo. And Kate Alpert, in one of her newsletters from the 30s, talks about sledding down Salt Pond and out onto the frozen ice. And she never dared tell her mother and father because she knew that they should not be going out onto Salt Pond ice. But they did it anyway because they were adventurous and young. I don't know what, oh, Salt Pond and the schoolhouse in the 20s. This is from the beach. Looking up at the schoolhouse, the schoolhouse is the building you see at the top of the road. There are still very few trees. Here's another view in the 40s. And it's a colored picture. And it's so tranquil. And I know it's 40s because the new highway is here. And the state police barracks has become the Joseph family's house. <laughs> and this is shell fishing in the 50s. It's from the East Ham Vacationist <coughs> handbook, this photo. And then this is the dedication of the National Park at the Visitor Center. And they have the buses that brought the people parked right along the highway. Salt Pond Road is gone. That used to, we used to ride our bikes down that hill and just pray there were no cars. There weren't any cars coming, but we always worried that there might be as we, you know, crossed over. And this is Hillside Motel where one of my best friends growing up lived. Ice House Ponds. Many, many of the ponds in East Ham were called Ice House Ponds. Not as many as had ice houses on them. <laughs> Jemima and Little Depot were both known as Ice House Ponds on different maps. And here's Little Depot looking towards Great Pond with a couple of the hatch cottages on the hill behind them. This, I think, is all, we're on Samoset Road there, looking towards Great Pond Road, but back then it was called Pond Road and it was only a dirt track. Here's Ice House. I believe this might be the same house, but it's later because you can tell from the trees. <laughs> and were they called ice houses because they would cut ice from the frozen ponds for refrigeration? They cut ice from the frozen ponds for refrigeration, absolutely. And they would take, they had like railroad runners for a little cart that would take the big ice blocks up into the ice houses. Tom Brown was, lived on Mill Road and he was the ice man and refrigerators didn't come to East Ham until the late 30s, um, early 40s. And so he was very, very busy uh, supplying ice. 
when my grandparents built their cottages down at Cook's Brook, they had the ice box with the blocks of ice in that ice box to keep everything. Mill Pond, also known as Long Pond or Depot. Three photos here. So Homer Smith's cottages, they're now the Gibson cottages. They're right off Depot Road. Uh, Depot Road, which turns into Samoset. And this is an old ad for his cottages. A woman wrote to the archives a couple years ago and said, I stayed in these cottages, I loved them, I went to the record hops, I don't know where they were. And we tried to figure out where they were. And we loved swimming at this pond, and we swam right down the little, um, mm, not very far away, you know, we, this was our favorite little path to the pond of, over here. What I love about this ad is the phone number, those of you who have been here for a while, Orleans 299W1. We were Orleans 178W1. It was an eight party line. <laughs> My cousins were W3. My grandmother was 178M3. When we called her, we had to ask the operator She'd say, number please, and I'd, we'd say, 178M3, please. And then we'd have to hang up because the phone wouldn't ring if we, were, we had our line open. And then guess when Grammy or Grandpa would make it to the phone. You know, it was fun. But you could also hear everybody else talk. <laughs> and the operator would sometimes get on and say, well, you kids get off this line. <laughs> This is Mill Pond and Grove, East Ham, Mass. I don't know which section of the pond this is. It, Mill Road used to be called Old Mill Road, and at one time it was called Lake View Road, because I think it ran along the whole pond and you could see the road or the lake. And the depot, of course, was on one of the ponds right there, depot pond. It, this, I think, has both of them in. I don't know if this is the little depot or the depot or which direction it's. I could figure it out. But. Do, you, do you know what year this is? No. I don't. But there aren't very many trees. <laughs> Fairly early. George Clark has his store there, the library is there, and the um, post office is there, so they haven't moved yet. Great Pond, the largest of six great ponds on the Cape. Four of them are on the lower Cape, the outer Cape. East Ham, Wellfleet, Truro, and Provincetown all have great ponds. And Falmouth and, who's the other one? Bourne have a great pond. Ours is 109 acres, and it's only a quarter of a mile from the bay. Kind of seems longer, but that's all. Quarter of a mile. Swimming lessons in the 50s. <laughs> this is from the Vacationist Handbook again. And I have to tell you, um, Lainey uh, used to be LaPlante. What's her, oh, what's her name now? Anyway, she came into the archives one day and we started talking. We realized she was my swimming teacher. <laughs> and then I found this photo for her. And I really think this is me. <laughs> I think this is my twin sister. I don't know if this is Peter Brown or not. <laughs> But we loved swimming lessons in Great Pond, fresh water. Junior life-saving swimming lessons were in Salt Pond. Uh, but these were Great Pond. And here's, now the roads going by Great Pond were, no, a history first. 
1816, the town leased Great Pond to Joshua Atwood. The Atwoods live right up the road and others for 50 years on the condition that they dig a canal within 10 years to bring the salt water from the bay in for the purpose of suffering alewives to pass into it. They didn't succeed. In 1855, they made, there was another attempt by the Great Pond Canal Company of East Tam. And the canal would go from the Herring Run at the end of Cole Road into Bridge Pond, out Bridge into Great Pond. And I'm told that it's still there. And there is a, a runway out of Gray Pond on the other side towards Deborah Pond and Depot. Um, I pass by it on some walks, but I'm not quite sure what it's there for. So the road from Samoset all the way up past the back of the cemetery to the highway when it still went straight to the highway was Pond Road. And then it became known as Great Pond Road. And then because there were so many accidents at that intersection where it came out, they blocked that off and they made a, a different turn in. So they took all of that off. And here's Wiley Park, I think, coming up. When was Wiley Park built? My brother thinks it's in the 70s because he doesn't remember it as a kid. His swimming lessons were still at Great Pond. Mars Wiley, for whom it is named, was a select man, and he retired in 1962 after many years as a selectman. I know there are signs over there, but I didn't get a chance to go over to see, and I couldn't find it anywhere online when it was formed and when, this, and when everything moved over there from the Great Pond side that we knew. My son took swimming there in the 70s. That, yeah, okay. So it had to be right around the mid 70s. Thank you. Jemima, Muddy, and Herring. I, I put these three together because they all have different names and they all have wonderful childhood memories for us. So here's the map. It's the 1880 map. I've outlined Muddy Pond. Only had one other name and that was back in 1856. It was called Mud Pond. <laughs> Little Muddy, you already know, is called Jemima or Ice House. I don't know why, I'd never heard it called Little Muddy, but back in, it must have been. And Cole's Pond is also known as? Herring. Herring and Lawton. Here's Judge Lawton's house. So my memories, Jemima. John Ullman, Debbie Ullman's father, explains who Jemima was in an interview that he made in the 80s. It's named for Mimi Clark, Jemima Clark, his great, great aunt. And we called it Aunt Jemima's growing up. I think simply because my mother called it Aunt Jemima's because Jemima was also a great, great aunt of my mom's foster mother. It was also known, I just mentioned that, Little Muddy or Ice House. Favorite memories there are skating. In the late 50s and 60s, the firemen, you're, were you? Well, I remember the I lived in here in Vaughan. Okay. They put up the floodlights, and the whole town would go down on weekend nights. 
Mom made us put our skates on at home. And then we put skate guards on them and walked down to Jemima's to skate. We had a ball. Oh, favorite memory, favorite memory. Muddy Pond is favorite because it was our backyard. The S. Higgins house is Snow Higgins. It's now the Swift Daily house where we spent most of our childhood, and this was just a stone's throw from the back door. The barn was right about here, and the sand pit was over here. <laughs> and we, was it Ani Dawkey who built our rowboat for us? She gathered, the, 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 you know, uh, old rowboat, but she cocked it up and painted it up, and little red rent and, but we weren't allowed to leave it at the pond. No, so we had to carry it home, and, and, and that's next to the super, and then carry it down. And at that time, the Little Red Rented Robot song came out. So we would chug along with Little Red Rented Robot. <laughs> Not much better than no boat, but at least it'll go when you row, row, row. <laughs> And we would catch turtles, and I'm embarrassed to say we would paint them and sell them to the tourists <laughs> at my grandmother's, along with the vegetables from her garden. And Mr. Vandermeer, who had Whispering Pines cottages and a dock and paddle boats, let us use them. And so he was great, a really great neighbor. And the road between the two properties of the Dailies and the uh, Vandermeers is called Vandale now, when the post office went in. And the post office, just for fun, is on top of the apple orchard that used to belong to my grandparents. <laughs> They covered it over and built up the land to put in the post office. What year? <sighs> she gave them for the post office, and that's when they covered it over. It's when it moved. It used to be the liquor store at the Superette, and before that, it was in next to the fireplace in the Superette. Um, trying to think, early 60s? Maybe 50s? 50s, because we used to go to the gas station next door and get the push-up rockets and caps. Rolls of caps that we didn't have cap gun guns for, but we could put them on the tar and use a rock. <laughs> Herring Pond. Herring Pond. Oh, I didn't mention that. Herring Pond was a favorite pond for swimming because we would spend hours at First Encounter Beach and we would be salty and hot and sweaty and Mum would say, we're stopping off at Herring on the way home. Lawton, she would say, it's not Herring. When my brothers went, it was Herring. <laughs> and you go to rinse off and we would and the water was cold, the water was clear. You swam out and then there was a ledge that you could dive down as far as to see who could dive down deeper than anybody else. And the Herring Brook ran under the road then, didn't used to, and we would crawl through to the other side. <laughs> it was an idyllic childhood in East Ham in the 50s and 60s. This is Herring Pond. They call it Herring, but at this point it was Coles. But it's labeled, and it was the Herring Pond because they stocked it, too. And they had the canal. I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but the canal, the first one was built in 1804 into this pond. Let's see what I have here. The river was also known as Great Meadow River and Bee's River. I do not know who Bee was. I'm told it's not for bees, that it's for a person, but I couldn't find that anywhere. But as Herring River, 
Henry David Thoreau, when he came down in the mid-1800s and, and walked, he said, uh, he passed through East Ham, he commented on the abundance of so many herring rivers. He said there were more rivers than there were herrings <laughs> in East Ham. So the Great Meadow, and oh, this is from a 1937 assessor's map. Here is the Herring River. I outlined it so it would be more. And here's where it goes under the road, which is Herring Brook Road. I had to put that in. And it's uplands, meadows, and marshes. A gentleman recently asked what the meadows were used for. So I'm going to tell you because they were used for crops, for salt hay, and food feed for livestock. And the land was considered very valuable. In 1711, the town gave land grants of four acres each to all the widows in East Ham. I keep thinking Widow Harding must have gotten one of these grants. <laughs> Maybe that's where her land was. But it had to be land that would provide some kind of income for the widows. And many of the grants were over in the salt marshes on the west side, on the west shore. As for the roads, it's called Herringbrook, obviously. What we know as Crosby Village Road was Damon Road. Yeah, it was Damon Road when I was little. And because the Damons had a house, there's another map and it'll show the Damons property there. And I don't know when it became Crosby Village. Um, my father built that, but I don't know when he finished it because he kept moving it back until it became one. Right. That's when it got renamed. Yeah. Probably in the mid 50s, late 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating how, how you find these things. And Judge Lawton, of course, has a road named for him. It's up just to the left of Lawton Pond, Herring Pond. So a couple more creeks and rivers and man made canals. The Rock Harbor, right here. This map by Eileen Kingsland says that a great storm forced passage through the Cape here. I don't think it did. It was here where Jeremiah's gutter is. More about that later. But we have roads here. And let me see. Um, I just want, I just realized it's late. I don't have very much more, I have slides that are kind of show and tell and I won't be explaining things, so I'm sorry that I'm going more slowly than I should. But we have the Great Meadow, we have Boat Meadow, we have Jeremiah's Creek, we have Governor Prince Road that used to be called Cedar Swamp Road. And it's because it was a cedar swamp and people used to cut, they learned to cut peat. Reverend Samuel Osborne came from Ireland and showed them how to cut uh, stack dry peat for fuel for the winter because the Cape was denuded <laughs> and they needed something. And Fulcher owned a lot of this land and so I'm gonna move more quickly Another map of the same area, and which shows the rivers and the, um, oh, I hate it when I keep going up there. I didn't mean to do that. Bridge Road, Bridge Road is the Red Road. And it's from the home of A.E.L. Walker, all the way, no, sorry, G.M. Walker, lots of walkers up here, all the way down to the home of Mrs. T.A. Nickerson. <laughs> Tamsin was the postmistress. She was also my mom's foster mother. I saw that and I went, Tamsin, Addie. <laughs> Cedar Swamp is 
Governor Prince, which goes all the way up to the Knowles Farm on Fort Hill. This road from C.A. Rogers all the way through to Bridge Road is Hay Road. This road in from um, Smith's to the railroad track is Southeast Tam Road. This road down by the Runnels place, the women said, is Bayview. It's the, it goes to Boat Meadow now. And, and those meadows were so valuable that flat bottoms boats could go on them and other boats in, at high tides. And they used them extensively during the War of 1812 to kind of get around the British embargo of the ports and harbors. They could use them. And there were several different companies, I won't go into the details, that wanted to build canals through them. One of them was Jeremiah's Creek. Um, all of them failed. So Governor Prince, I had hay. Was used to be called Pine Road. Southeast Ham was Cross Street because it crossed from the road to the tracks. And Bayview led to Boat Meadow. Oh, I forgot. This was supposed to be a quiz. This is the creek. And I was sure that only one person in here would know the name of that creek. Abilino's. Abilino Downs Creek. Former owner of the house I lived in. Right, yes. Uh, Jeremiah's Gutter. Also called, it was named for Jeremiah Smith, who owned all of the land there. It was also called Jeremiah's Dream, Jeremiah's Cut, Jeremiah's Dream, which is an old word for drain. And there are many, many stories about it. This photo is from the Tercentenary book that was put out in 1951 to celebrate 300 years of East Ham history. It has some wonderful old photos in it. And very, Captain Cyprian Southwick was sent to the Widda to try and find the booty of that pirate ship that came ashore in a storm in 1717 before the East Hammers could get there. He didn't, they did. He just found the bodies and had to bury them. In 1804, there was the first committee to dig a canal because they knew it could be navigated because storms had allowed them to do that. That failed after a few years. The War of 1812, as I said, it was used to evade the British blockade. In 1817, East Ham and Orleans got together as the canal proprietors. They had a whole scheme for um, charging for a flat bottom boat, it was 10 cents, and for a raft, it was less than that and everything. Uh, and they needed permission. There was going to be some kind of a lottery to raise money. That failed. The last known record of a high tide coming through so that boats could go from the bay through Tom Cove to the ocean was 1844. I should have been going this fast all along. Sorry. <laughs> More brooks and beaches. This is Coal Road. This is the Herring Brook. They have to dig this out with a big caterpillar cat thing these days because it gets filled in every winter. But the herring run do run there. Do any of you count the herring? And here, I know lots of people in East Ham do. This is, um, so we have Herring Brook and Beach. We also have Silver Spring Brook and Beach. We have Cook's Brook and Beach. We have Indian Brook and which is now Hatches Creek. And all of these, you just kind of, I didn't think of them. I, I mean, the names didn't sink in that all of these brooks came in. The roads that came by them 
Uh, not important. This is my dad and grandfather fishing at Cooksbrook <laughs> in the 30s. They loved fishing. My dad always wore a suit. He's a teenager here. <laughs> Grandpa Ray. Well-known beaches. So here's one of the historical maps by Eileen Kingsland again. And I'm starting down here with Kingsbury, Thumpertown, Campground, Silver Spring. But there are others that aren't on this map. Uh, Sunken Meadows. I walked that. I didn't usually go all the way down to Northeast Ham on the Bay Side. I usually stop at Campground or at the most Cook's Brook. One day I did go down and I climbed the little hill and I went, oh my God, that's why they call it Sunken Meadow. It's, a, it's this huge meadow that's really low in the ground. And it's South and North Sunken Meadow and takes us right up to the Audubon. Uh, I was going to give you the history of the campgrounds and the Thumper Town because they could hear the thumping from the camp towns, but I'll just show you the photos. Oh, first encounter first. I took all of these photos. The, as kids, we would climb this. It was up on the hill. It's wonderful. The brass plaque has been stolen in the last two or three years. It's just pride right off of that granite. Stone. Do you know who set that up as a sign? George Abbott. Which one? The, the, no, this one. The one yeah, in the middle. Yeah, the one in the middle. That's the 2001 one from George yes. Abbott, yes. Right. So the original marker, at least we have a facsimile at the town hall. There's a replica. But the 2001 is the one that's in the parking lot now at first encounter. Yeah. We loved it. We climb up there, we tie our towels around our necks and we would jump off and be superwoman, you know, <laughs> flying down the dunes, which you're not allowed to <laughs> do anymore. Kingsbury, Thumbertown and Campground. This is Kingsbury Beach and it's pre-World War II. And I love it because there are only three mm -hmm. buildings here and none of the cottages right along the bluff. And this is how the people got to the campground meetings. They would come in a packet boat. They would be transferred to a horse-drawn carriage at the packet boat. They, the carriage would drag them up to the beach and then they would walk the extra mile up to the camp meetings. And at the camp meetings, they would say their prayers and have revivals and do make so much noise that it, the thumps of their mm -hmm. chants could be heard down at Thumbertown, which wasn't so far away. We're at the halfway ponds again in a clearer map. Some of these roads are really interesting. Steel Road is named for William B. Steele. When we were growing up, we called it Cook's Brook Road because it led to Cook's Brook Beach. Uh, Oak Road was known as Oak Grove Road and it went from the filling station of Nellie Nickerson to the Bracket store. Cable Road used to be called Town Road, and it went to the French cable station. And Kingsbury was named Kingsbury by the women, but now it's called Kingsbury Beach. Oh, and on this map, it's Meeting House Pond, not Ministers and Schoolhouse. What is that building on the bottom? Uh, this is... It's the Methodist Church. It's the meeting house that was right at the head of the congregational, 
the cemetery. So what used to be the French cable station? I love these two photos. This is as it's being built, and this is it along the bluff with the three sisters. The Knowles Farm up on Fort Hill. I do believe this is the house that's still there, that Sarah Burrell has, but this is the rest of the farm, which is no longer there at Fort Hill. Deacon John Doan's homestead, the area. The marker is still there, but you can look through to the Coast Guard station and the homes that used to be beside it. Governor Prince House used to be the oldest house in East Ham. That's right in your area also. And he had his pear tree, which gave fruit for 275 years. This is not the pear tree, but the, these are photos of the house. Clarksville. I like Clarksville because Tamsin Nickerson was a Clark before she married Nickerson. And it's the area of Samoset Road that had so many people in that same family grow that they called it Clarksville. I think it's... Is that 700 Samoset Road that used to be a, a bed and breakfast? I think so. I'm not sure. We used to call that the haunted house. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was the one on the highway. <laughs> there was another. <laughs> Cedar Bank Links used to be. The 18-hole golf course. Some called it the finest in, ever. And here's the map of it. This is the ocean side. Here's the town hall right here, right there. And you pulled yourself across the little inlet on a little uh, raft kind of thing. 1928, a project for someone who needed a project after being ill. The Northeast Ham Depot. These are all from our old postcard collections. And the East Ham Depot. Yeah, unbelievable, right where the Samoset crosses. Oh, Samoset used to be known as West Shore Road, used to be known as Depot Road Street, and used to be known as Station Street. Because the, the road led to the depots and past the depots to the West Shore. Briggs Field, our airport. Here, this is Route 6 and this is Massasoit Road that comes in. This is the runway. Aerial shot. It's right behind the fairway. The fairways the complex is right up here. And after the war, that's when it was so popular. All, and the men who had gone off to war had learned to fly. And when they came back, this is George Duffy. He made a bet that he could fly a big, you know, land a plane and take off from that really short runway. He did it. My cousin, just this past weekend, gave me pictures of planes and three guys who came down in a storm and they couldn't land, they couldn't find, they, it was after dark, they were afraid they were gonna crash. He, he radioed someone, somebody got all the guys in East Ham to go out there with their cars and they lined up on either side with their headlights on. <laughs> And these, we have wonderful photos of those, but that's for my next talk when I do it on transportation. So what might have been? These are the last two slides. 1937 assessor's map. This is the cover of the assessor's map, the index sheet that shows all of the different assessor's maps that are in that packet. We're gonna look right here at these maps. 
And this shocked me to no end when I saw it. These are, this is the development that was planned in 1937 for the end of Cable Road. And I have to tell you, starting up here, I, 9th Ave, Sunrise Ave, 8th, 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, Nosset Ave, 3rd Ave, and then this one, this side is below this, 2nd Ave, 1st Ave, Cable Road, Central Ave, Sunset Ave. But these street names that are, go crossways, they have nothing to do with East Tim. The one set from left to right below Central Ave, Cherry, Ash, Maple, Walnut, Chestnut, Pine, Poplar, and Linden. And then the final ones, Bay, St Bay Street, Orient Street, Regent Street, and Oxford Street. And it was called the East Ham Land Group that put this together. And I thought, what might have been? <laughs> So, I look at that plan, I think of our logo at the East Ham Historical Society that was created so many years ago, preserving East Ham's past for East Ham's future. And I realize anew that what we do as the Historical Society is so important to our community. So I just want to thank you for coming. And I wonder if you have questions or comments, and I'm really sorry that that's longer than usual. I do want to show you, I mean, this is where I went for my research, that most of it was in the archives, but I'm a born educator, and you have to show um, where you get your information on the slides. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs>